The reading is from John 6, verses 16 to 24. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there, and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Mary. Now, we're going to uh, see some pictures of people who've done incredible things. Before we see our first picture, uh, I wonder, how did you feel coming out in the rain this morning? Was it a bit cold, a bit nasty? How do you feel when it's cold? Do you like it to be cold, or do you like it more when it's warm? I like it when it's warm and sort of toasty and snuggly. I wonder... Maybe you go to the seaside at the summer and you put your toe in the sea and it's really cold. Do you think, oh, that's lovely, I want to go in there? Or do you think, ooh? And when you walk in, what, if, you get, if you jump into the sea or if you walk right in until it gets up to your tummy, how do you, how do, you, do, you do you do what I do? <laughs> well, our first picture will be quite scary for you if that's you. Let's see the first one. Now that is a man called Wim Hof. And he is buried up to his neck in ice. That's like the sea, but much, much colder. And he set the world record. This is a photo of him setting the world record for the longest time submerged in a bath of pure ice. How long do you think you'd last? One second? Ten seconds? He did one hour and 52 minutes and 49 seconds. That's amazing, isn't it? How do you think people responded at the end of that? I reckon they gave him a big round of applause. Well done, Wim Hof. That is amazing. It's amazing. Let's see our next picture, Ollie. Now, this is a man called Dean Karnazes. Now, I don't know if you ever have to, to run to catch a bus, or you have to run because you're late for school, and, and mummy's saying, come on, you've got to get to school. And you run. How do you feel after you've run for a bit? It's a bit like when I get in the sea, isn't it? Like, <gasps> Now, Dean Carnazes likes to run a long way. And in the spring, in the autumn of 2006, he did something quite amazing. He ran a marathon on the 5th of September, in one American state. And then on the 6th of September, he ran another marathon in another American state. And he kept on going until the middle of November. For 50 days, he ran a different marathon in a different American state. And do you know what he did to celebrate when he'd finished? The last marathon he, he, he ran was in New York. And he lived in San Francisco, which is an awfully long way away takes hours just to fly there. Do you know what he decided to do? He thought, oh, I'm going to run home. <laughs> so he ran thousands of miles to get home. I mean, he did stop every now and then to have something to eat and a bit of a sleep. But that's amazing, isn't it? People are amazing. People do amazing things. How do you think people responded to Dean Karnazes when he'd run his 50th marathon on his 50th day in the 50th American state, New York state? I bet they gave him a round of applause and said, well done, Dean Karnazes. That was amazing. Amazing. Who's our next person? 
Well, this is a man called Peter Evans, and he, uh, he holds the world record for balancing things on his head. Now, don't try this at home, but maybe you could try, if you've got a Bible or something, you could try balancing that on your head and see how that feels. Hey, look, I'm the world champion Bible balancer. Well, this man, he's balancing a car on his head. How do you think people responded when they saw him balancing a car on his head? I bet they said, wow, well done. That is amazing. People do amazing things. Let's see our next one. Now, this is Laszlo Lazo Shala. And this is him doing the highest ever dive into water by a human being, at least the highest ever recorded and measured one. Now, that is from 58.8 metres in the air. Now, that probably doesn't mean anything to you, but when you go outside after the service, look at the tower of the church, and then imagine five of those all piled up together. And he dived off that into a lake in Switzerland. That's just terrifying, isn't it? How do you think people responded to Lazo Shala when he had dived into the water? I expect they went, I'm glad the water wasn't shallow. Well done, Lazo! <laughs> people do amazing things. And we'll just have one last one. Now, this is Sebastian Stutner. And this is a photograph taken about eight days ago, on the 25th of May, 2022 at Cap de Nord in Portugal. And uh, this is him riding the highest ever wave that's been surfed by a human being. I mean, it looks big, doesn't it? If you just turn around and look at what we can see of the church tower there, that's seven meters roughly from the ground to the top of that. Imagine three and a bit of those as a wave coming at you and thinking, I know what I want to do. I want to go swimming in that, and I'm going to do a, a, a big surf down the front of it. That's just amazing. How do you think people responded to Sebastian Stutner when he did that, when he won that world record? I bet they clapped their hands and they said, that is amazing. Never has anyone standing on water been quite so surprising and extraordinary. When people do amazing things, we're amazed. We cheer them on. We're really impressed. These are skills and tricks that people have learned how to do. And we see them and we say, wow, you've worked really hard. You're really clever. You're really strong. You're really brave. But that's amazing. Now, in the story from the Bible that we've just heard, Jesus did something even more amazing than any of that. There were waves on the sea. They probably weren't quite as big as that one that Sebastian was standing on there. But they were huge waves. A storm in which the disciples, who were fishermen, they lived in boats, they were scared. But then, when they looked, they saw Jesus walking towards them over the water. And what do you think they did when they saw Jesus walking on water? I mean, that's not a trick, is it? That's not a skill you can learn. You can't go to walking on water school, uh, and if you practice really hard, you, you learn how to do it. No, that's just, that's just amazing. It's, it's, it's something completely out of this world. And what do you think they did when they saw Jesus walking on the water in the middle of that storm? Do you think they went, wow, well done, Jesus, that's amazing. People do amazing things. Yeah, they didn't do that. I wonder if you can remember what we heard in the reading just now. How did they respond? What, was they, what did they think when they saw Jesus walking on the water? Did they think, wow, that's amazing? Or maybe they did, but what, what John tells us is they went, wow, that's scary. They were terrified at the sight of Jesus walking on the water. It wasn't a skill. It wasn't a trick. It wasn't because he was just really strong or really clever or really brave. It was a sign that he was something else altogether. Something more amazing, something more wonderful, and something altogether more frightening. Now, Jesus said to his disciples, don't be afraid. And in the end, they weren't afraid. And as the children go out to Sunday school now, they're going to uh, think about, and we're going to think about together here, why it was that they weren't afraid of this Jesus who, when they saw him walking on the water, 
was terrifying to them. So, grown-ups, we're going to stay in here and we're going to sing together. Uh, children, they've already made a run for it. Uh, they're on their way through to St. Monica's for Sunday school, children aged 3 to 11. Uh, and we're going to sing together, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Please stand together and we'll sing. Please take your seats. And if you've been balancing your Bibles on your head, please take them down and turn with me to John chapter 6, where we'll be looking uh, a bit more at this story of Jesus walking on the water. I'm not sure if you've been uh, watching much of the coverage of the Jubilee. Uh, I haven't managed to see as much as I would like, uh, but one clip I have seen was of a royal protection officer who had served the Queen for many, many years uh, and uh, who told the story uh, of walking with her near Balmoral. Now, they were walking out uh, in, the, in the highlands there, and um, they came across uh, a couple who were having a picnic. They were on a walking holiday, uh, and um, they began to have a conversation with them. This couple were from the United States uh, of America. And um, they began saying, oh, do, 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 you, do you live here? Uh, and the queen, who was with her protection officer, uh, just the two of them walking out together, uh, said, uh, no, I don't live here, I live in London, uh, but um, I have a holiday home here. And they said, oh, how long have you been coming? And she said, oh, about 80 years, since I was a little girl. And they said, wow, if you've been, li if you've been coming here for 80 years, you must have met the Queen. <laughs> and the Queen said, uh, no, I've not ever met the Queen, but uh, Peter here sees her regularly. <laughs> And they didn't really twig, and they, they sort of kept on chatting to her. Uh, and then uh, the best moment of all was when uh, suddenly the Royal Protection Officer found uh, this chap's arm round his shoulders and his camera in the hands of the Queen uh, so that they could get a photo of the chap who had met the Queen. And then they got a photo of all of them together. And the Queen, as they walked off, she said to, she said to her Protection Officer, she said, I do hope that they'll show that photograph to friends at home who will explain who I am. But I think there's quite a lot of that going on all the way through John's Gospel. People meet Jesus and they know there's something about him. They, they know there's something to be impressed by. They know there's something wonderful. They want to know him. They want to know more about him. But they just can't quite seem to see him for who he is. And John's Gospel is almost like one of those holiday snaps that someone else can sort of point to you and say, he's the king. Week by week, we've been coming back to that verse right at the end, chapter 20, verse 31, where John says, these, these signs, although Jesus did many signs, so many that all the books in the world couldn't hold them all, these are recorded that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, that is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John's sitting with us, looking at the holiday snap and saying, do you know who you're meeting when you meet Jesus? Do you know who you're dealing with? And this story of the walking on the water is part of one of those signs. It shows us the identity of Jesus. It helps us, if we're willing, to open our eyes and see him for who he is. So the basic outline of the story is, is, is pretty simple. Jesus has gone off on his own to pray up the mountain, and his disciples have decided that they're going to head across the lake uh, to Capernaum. And as they're out on the lake, they've rowed about three miles. Can you imagine that, rowing three miles uh, into heavy weather? Uh, and they're not really getting anywhere. The, the, the water's grown rough. Uh, and they see Jesus approaching, walking on the water. And they are terrified. Well, you would be, I suppose, wouldn't you? Mark supplies a little bit of extra information. He tells us that they thought they'd seen a ghost. Well, that's something that Jesus' disciples thought more than once about him. They thought about him, that about him at the resurrection too, that he was a spirit, somehow an unworldly being. But no. 
This is a man walking dry shod across the lake. Now, if you were here last week, you'll know what this follows from. In the first 14 verses of chapter 6, Jesus tells us the story of Jesus feeding, John tells us the story of Jesus feeding a great crowd, 5,000 people in the wilderness. He gives them bread to eat in a place where there is no bread. And the people are so amazed, verse 14, that they say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. They recognize a kind of theme that, that, that sometimes in a film you recognize a character by the music, don't you? There's a theme that is played that sort of, you, you hear it and you think, this person is, is, is going to be a significant player in this scene. And, and the theme that's being played in this section of John's Gospel is the theme of the Exodus. The story of how God took his people out of slavery in Egypt and took them through the, promise, through the, the wilderness, where they spent 40 years wandering in circles in the desert, but not starving before he led them into the promised land. And as they wandered in the desert, he gave them bread to eat in the wilderness. Uh, and the prophet who led God's people was called Moses. And at the end of Moses' life, Moses made a prophecy that another prophet like him would arise to rescue God's people once and for all. And on hearing the sort of exodus themes of feeding in the wilderness, the people say, this must be that prophet, the one like Moses, who has come to rescue. They recognize something about Jesus. They recognize his theme is playing. But what they don't realize is that he's not one like Moses, but Moses was one like him. That Moses was like a picture pointing forward to Jesus, who's the real event. So they think, this is, this is like Moses feeding the people in the wilderness. He is the prophet who was to come and say, verse 15, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. They've understood something about Jesus, but they don't know what kind of person they're really dealing with. They want to make him king. They want him to be a, a ruler like Moses who will somehow throw off the oppressor, Rome. Because once again, God's people live in slavery, not in Egypt this time, but in their own land at the hand of the Romans. And the people, recognizing Moses' theme, say, yes, a king who will rescue us like Moses, who will throw off the oppressor. Moses destroyed the army of Pharaoh. When God's people walked through the Red Sea on dry land, as God parted the Red Sea for them, as Moses held up his staff, God parted the Red Sea, the people walked through, and then Pharaoh pursued them with his horses and his chariots, the greatest war machine on earth, and God just closed the Red Sea over them and destroyed them. And they're looking for a great military victory like that. And now, out on the sea, comes Jesus walking on the sea as if it were dry land. Again, the Exodus theme swells. And yet, this isn't like Moses. For Moses, a great strong wind blew the sea away. This, is just, this strong wind is just blowing the sea into peaks and troughs, but Jesus is walking over it like it was lumpy ground. And they are terrified. Who is this who has such control over the elements, who is not in any way hampered by the force of the sea, by the force of the wind. Who is this that doesn't sink? They're really scared. 
And Jesus says to them, don't be afraid, it is I. And, and, and then immediately the boat reaches the shore. There's this kind of great kind of calming miracle, the calming of the disciples, the calming of the sea. Suddenly they're on dry land and all is well again. And the crowd is following. The crowd can't find Jesus where they were, so uh, they uh, find out where he is and, and they trek round uh, and they come to him. They're searching for Jesus. But who are they searching for? They're searching for the one who gave them bread in the wilderness. They're searching for the one who can offer them power. Who can offer them what they think they need. Which is freedom from Roman oppression. Which is plentiful food so that they will never starve. And Jesus explains in the in the following passage, just how wrong they are about him. I mean, he can do all of those things, but their vision, their imagination, is far too small. They want from Jesus what an ordinary or perhaps an extraordinary ruler could give. They want a great king, but Jesus wants to be more than that for them. So if you scan down to verse 43, just read what Jesus says about what he has come to do. They're arguing with him about bread, and he says, stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. And I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood... You have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day, for my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. You see, there's a sort of bookend. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert and died. But I've come that ye may live forever. Moses came to lead the people out of slavery in Egypt. Jesus comes to set the people free too. But not from the Romans. From an enemy so terrible that no one ever dreamt they could be set free from it. from death. Jesus says, whoever eats this bread will never die. Whoever drinks my bread, my blood, has life in them. And he says, I'm the son. So remember, John wants us to know that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God. He says, if you believe in him, that he is the Messiah and the son of God, you will have life. Uh, And all the way through John's Gospel, Jesus uses this language of sonship about himself in order to point to what he has come to do. So he says, I have life in me because the Father gives me life. That's what a father-son relationship looks like, isn't it? A son only lives because the Father lives and gives life. That's why the language of sonship is so important in John. Because Jesus can point to his relationship with the Father and say, I have life from him. 
And then he says, just as I have life from the Father, so if you believe in me, you will have life from me. Putting your trust in the Son who receives life from the Father is to receive life from the Son just as he receives life from the Father. That's why it's so important for John that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Because it actually points to just how big what Jesus is talking about really is. He is saying, I have come so that you may participate in the life of God himself. For John, eternal life is not like kind of waterproofing. What, what I mean by that is, like, if you looked outside this morning and you saw how wet it is, you will probably have reached for something waterproof, a coat or an umbrella, something that's got a kind of coating on it that stops the water getting in. And we think of eternal life, I suspect, a bit like that, in that we think of this kind of imperviousness to death, that that's what it would mean, that somehow it's a kind of taking away the, the sort of possibility of, uh, of dying and kind of applying that to you as you are, so that you kind of carry on your life, but death-proof instead of waterproof. Does that make sense? I think that's how we tend to think about it. But Jesus is saying something much bigger than that. His vision of eternal life is this, that you're actually coming by your relationship with the Son to share the relationship he shares with the Father. That's how he teaches us to pray, isn't it? When you pray, say, Our Father. The inheritance of every Christian is to call God Father. Why? Because we're united to the Son and we receive life from the Son, just as the Son receives life from the Father. So eternal life isn't death-proofing. It is being drawn up into and participating in the life of the eternal, unimaginably great God. And Jesus points to that in terms of the relationship of love that we receive from the Father. We're loved by the Father just as the Father loves the Son. We share in the life of the Father and the Son. So that eternal life isn't just you but forever. It is you but drawn up into the life of the Godhead in some mysterious way so that you participate in the very power at the heart of reality. You share in his life, in his goodness, in his beauty, in his joy. Which is why Jesus uses this idea of eating, taking the son into yourself, participating in him sharing his life. So he says, Jesus, don't think about me as being like Moses, someone who can give you bread in the desert. Look, your ancestors ate bread in the desert and they died. But he who believes in me will never die. Will share in eternal life. This new exodus that Jesus has brought is not a freedom from slavery in Egypt, not a freedom from slavery to the Romans, a freedom from slavery to death. And to the root of death, sin. So when Jesus talks about slavery in John's Gospel, he says this, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Actually, anecdotally, we know that, don't we? One of the things that the Ten Commandments tells us not to do is lie. But we know, don't we, if you've ever told a lie, and I bet you have, that as soon as you tell a lie, you become a slave to that lie. You have to tell more lies in order to keep the original lie intact. It grows. It takes over. It can take over your life if at some point you don't break the power of it and say, I lied to you. I'm so sorry. I lied to you. That was not true. That's what sin is like. It enslaves you. It takes you into its power and you 
at its very worst, you're not free to get, to get, to get away from it. And Jesus says anyone who sins is a slave to sin. If you've ever done anything, thought anything, said anything, contrary to the will of God, you're a slave. It has power over you. And part of that power is death, because that's what sin brings. And every human being who's ever been born in the world, other than Jesus, has been born in that slavery, has been born to die. And Jesus says, I've come to set you free from that. Your ambitions for me in making me king are far too small. I've come to change everything. I've come to set you free from a slavery that you didn't even think you could be free from. Maybe you didn't even think you could.